Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bruce Devalier, and I am general counsel for Nadeco, and I'm honored to be part of a, an illustrious group such as Nadeco that has a long history of trying to do the right thing and keep democracy safe, restore democracy, and restore the rule of law. And the primary question I think that should be asked, most of the people here in the audience know this, is why should we care about Nigeria? Why should the United States care about Nigeria? Why should the international community care about Nigeria? What would you say if I told you that there was a country that has arguably the world's oldest democracy with full participation of all of its members? What would you say if I told you that there is a country where a group of people has the oldest written constitution featuring guarantees for individual freedom and due process in the world. What would you say if I told you there was a country that for, for, featured full participation of women in its political system, both to vote and to govern, and they started doing this when Europe was in the Dark Ages, in the 800s? What would you say if I told you there was a country that is consistently in the top 10 of oil producing nations since the 1980s. What would you say if I told you this same country has never been openly antagonistic or antagonistic to the United States, has never been an enemy of the United States, in fact, has never been an enemy of the West? What would you say if I told you this very same country has the greatest number of doctors living in the United States of America per capita than any other nation in the world, more than England, more than Russia, more than Germany. What would you say if I told you that 29% of the immigrants from this country over the age of 25 hold a graduate degree when you compare that to 11% of the population of the United States over the age of 25 holding a graduate degree? This country has almost three times more people holding graduate degrees here in the United States contributing to our economy and our well-being and our security. What would you say if I told you the same country has 45 percent of the involvement of its uh, it, people, the immigrants that live here, the diaspora in education services, and most are professors at top universities? What would you say if I told you the same country I'm talking about? Has the, they're entering the medical fields and the technology, technological fields in a rapidly expanding rate. They're increasing the U.S. economy. They are entrepreneurs. They are making America better, building tech companies in the United States to help the people back home. Would anybody be able to guess that country was in Africa? Would anybody be able to guess that country is Nigeria? Because it is. That's Nigeria. So when you say, why Nigeria, it is almost a fool's question. One of the greatest nations that has all of these things going for it, and yet we constantly, constantly turn our back on Nigeria. Shouldn't we be favoring this nation? Shouldn't we be more attentive to this nation? Shouldn't we treat this nation, this giant of an entire continent, not of a region or an area, of an entire continent, that stands out as a shining beacon, shouldn't we treat them as especially favored allies of the United States and indeed of the West? Especially given the insecurity in the world today with issues relating to extremism and energy shortages, don't you think that this is a nation that the world should readily leap to the fore to protect, to ensure the well-being so it can continue on its pathway to greatness? Yeah, we're talking about Nigeria, the largest nation in Africa. It is the wealthiest nation in Africa, and yet it's the poorest country in the world. Nigeria now has more people living below the poverty line than any other nation in the world, which is a remarkable feat, given that there are 234 million people in Nigeria and approximately 1.4 billion people in India, the former dubious leader of world's poverty. How can we let that happen? How can we turn our back? How is that possible? Nigeria is also the site of the largest genocidal slaughter the world has seen since World War II. And yet nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to do anything about it. 
I am here very proud to be involved with NDECO because NDECO wants to do something about that. Something is very, very, very wrong. And it starts with the ability to choose your leaders in full, open, and fair elections. Nigeria has descended into a kleptocracy. And what that means is theft is the coin of the realm. Not due process, not laws, not fundamental fairness, not the pursuit of happiness, not freedom, not family, not religion, not work, not prosperity. But who can steal the most first and go back and steal some more? And that is something that I believe the Nigerian people can solve on their own, but they're going to have to have the help. We cannot continue to turn our back on Nigeria. The international ramifications or aspects are very clear. Article 25 of the International Con Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which was adopted in 1966, became law and active in 1976, was adopted by the United States in 1992 and by Nigeria, fully adopted, says that every citizen, every citizen shall have the right and the opportunity without any of the distinctions mentioned in Article 2 and without unreasonable restrictions to take part in the conduct of public affairs directly or through freely chosen representatives and to vote. This treaty signed by Nigeria and by the United States, and by the way, in the United States, when we sign a treaty, it becomes the law of the land with certain restrictions. So the United States has to comply with this. Nigeria has to comply with this international edict. It is as fundamental as any human right. And let me quote the UN, the Covenant 25 says, to vote and to be elected at genuine periodic elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret ballot, guaranteeing the free expression of the will of the electors. That's why this is important. We have a violation of international law that rises to a violation of human rights, and we all know the human rights violations that follow. And it's by a nation that we should hold in special favor, that should, we should hold more closely, that we should take better care of. The fact, care of. The fact of the matter is that what was supposed to happen and again, we are not partisan, the DECO is not partisan, but it appears as though the process, and that's what, that's, that's what nations, that's what a democracy is. That's the greatness of America, is the process. It's not the people, it's the process. It's not the result, it's the process. How, we, how our government works, how our elections work. And the process of this election in the 2023 Nigerian pres presidential elections appears to be fundamentally flawed. We believe, Nadeco believes, that the February 25 to 26, 2023 election, the results, the hasty announcement of the results, are fundamentally at odds with the Nigerian election laws. And as Dr. Ogebi said very clearly, they didn't just violate rules, they violated their own laws. INEC glorified their efforts to make this the cleanest, the purest, the most transparent and fair election in Nigerian history, in African history. And yet, they violated every single fundamental tenet in every single law. They instituted the bimodal voter accreditation system. You've heard about that, the BVAS. All that is, make no mistake about it, there's a lot on the internet that seems to people want to believe that when you voted with the BVAS that that recorded your vote and your vote was sent somewhere and it went to a server and it was tabulated and somehow Tanubu or the APC were able to hijack that electronic signal. That's not what happened. It was more pernicious than that. It was more old fashioned than that. All the BVAS studs was gave you two modes of, of identification, both your card, you put your card, your voting card, your PVC in, and it also did your fingerprint and face identification. But it failed. And the reason Beavis was important is so that people couldn't vote more than once. Vote early, vote often. The reason it's important is so people could vote, could not vote that had fake cards. And on the issue of the, the, uh, the PVC cards, INEC announced, this is INEC themselves, said that there were 87.2 million PVC cards collected. That was out of 93 million registered voters. So approximately 6 million people were registered 
They just didn't bother to get their voting card. No one knows why. It just happens. But what's fascinating is if you consider it true that 87.2 million people had PVC voting cards and could have voted, the declared winner of this election received 8.7 million votes. Now, out of 87 million, the math's not real hard. That means that Mr. Tanubu got 10% of the vote. He will be ruling the wealthiest economy in Africa with a mandate of 10% of the population. That's extraordinary. Something is seriously wrong. Something is seriously wrong. Additionally, we believe that what has to happen and why we're here today, and Nadeco is leading the charge, we believe that INEC has to prove itself. It has to prove the results it announced were true and were real. There are 176,600 poll 176, polling stations. That's a lot of polling stations. INEX rules required each polling station to collect the votes, count the votes, and they do it the old-fashioned way. They get the paper votes. They count them. They put them in stacks for each of the primary candidates. They were to gather those results, publish the local results, and then transmit the results, and ultimately they would go to Abuja and be certified. Well, what happened was is they published some of the results early on, and then they took them down. And so what they have is something that looks a little bit like this, scribbling, when it used to look like this, where it was written, someone didn't like the results. That's what appears to have happened. Dr. Ogebe observed it happening. So what we have is vote rigging, vote buying, and bribery. So despite INEX efforts, nothing good happened. And we're back to the same old thing, the same old efforts. So what do we do? What do we do in the United States? What do we do as members of the diaspora? What do we do as international attorneys or international law folks? What do we do to ensure democracy can thrive, that the promise of 1960 can come true again, hopefully? Well, we are asking that INAC throw open the curtains and let the full light of truth come in to prove the transparency and the veracity of the results they've announced. If the results are true, they should be able to prove it. It is absolutely not extraordinary to ask them to prove it. Show me your math. We've all gone to school. Show me your math. You've got a number. Show me how you got to that number. Prove what you did. There can be no debate that the initial investigations indicate that they were savaged. The rules were savaged. The rights of the electorate were savaged. It was polluted by blatant and widespread corruption. And as Dr. Lloyd said, the four horsemen of democracy's doom, bribery, intimidation, insecurity, and vote rigging, appeared to trot and run roughshod all over the nation. They were harnessed to skew the results. We, Nadeco, call upon the people of Nigeria to act peacefully, but to demand that proof be provided to them, that INEC prove the results they've announced. We also call upon the international community to join together with the Nigerian judiciary in a concerted effort to condemn and set aside the hastily announced results and instead proceed with the solemn seriousness this deserves. Again, one of the world's great nations is at peril here, continues to be at peril here. We need to make sure we don't continue to turn our back on Nigeria. And what we're asking for is very simple. Prove to us. Prove. Nadeco says prove to us that if there is a, if there is a Nigeria and there is a democracy in Nigeria, that it was arrived at lawfully and in accordance with the rule of law. The continuation of power by the ruling party is a wholesale disenfranchisement of Nigeria without more. That is little more than a dictatorship. And it's a new dictatorship 
but it is nonetheless a dictatorship because it's imposed apparently against the will of the people. And we believe the will of the people of Nigeria must be preserved. We believe the will of the people of Nigeria must be preserved. It must be sanctified and it must be held with the most solemn of regard. This event is designed to lead a global call to action to address INEX duplicity and to make sure that the truth is told and that what happened is exposed and the next steps can be taken. And I, for one, I, I know there is a lot of skepticism. I've appeared in this, well, a few rooms over a few years ago on the uh, Uzodima issue. I was involved in drafting briefs that were filed there. Uh, the Nigerian judiciary cannot always be relied on to do the right thing in, in elections. But I take a little bit of hope. You've got to be an optimist. You have to be an optimist because your faith in God and your love for your country and your love for your family, you got to be an optimist. The Nigerian judiciary showed us they have the ability to disregard what INECTA says and chart their own path toward justice. Now, we may disagree with what they did with Uzadima. Certainly, Ihe Rioja did, disagrees, and my clients did, but they have that ability. 